All right, so if you have your Bibles, you turn with me to Matthew 16, 24. Matthew 16, 24. So uh, picture this. The World Athletics Champions that happened in Budapest um, last year, they said the stakes were high, the crowd was buzzing, and the finish line gleamed tantalizing to those. So a woman by the name of Fem Femke Bowl was in the 400 meter uh, uh, four by four relay for the Dutch team. And so she is getting the baton for this last race. And let's watch the video as she gets the baton. This was last year. Some people in the orange, by the way. And more in contention. But here's what we're waiting for. Fem Cabal had to stick in front. Hard to believe that she will give up this lead for the Netherlands. I would be shocked if Fem Cabal gives up this lead. She has run under 50 seconds indoors and out. And she was toying with them this morning. She has a lot left in the tank. United States trying to hang on. But Ball looks very comfortable leading. Alexis Holmes is trying to stay with Fem Cabal. picture of her falling right there. Dang, that was pretty bad. So, I know that was unexpected. So, uh, we're going to be talking about this this morning, about how the soul can only take so much. See, I cater this run to what the soul is. It's a, you know, we lead off, we're running, everything's fine, everything's dandy. But over the course of the lap, how many know that a body can only go so far when it uh, is in this condition. And that's why I entitled this The Soul, because the soul can literally only take so much before a fall. So we're going to look about what Jesus says about the soul. If you'll read with me out of Matthew 16, we're going to start in verse 24. And by the way, I'm reading out of the New King James Version because I like the way it sounds. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any one desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses life for my sake will find it. What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul. Let's go ahead and pray. Let's ask God to help us. God, I thank you for the blood. And I pray, God, the Holy Spirit would be at work, God. God, I pray, Lord, you are the restorer of souls, God. Right now, move supernaturally that we would give our lives and our souls onto you, God. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's talk real quickly about the significance of the soul. See, Jesus made a very um, honest statement, and he told us about what's going to happen about people time and time again. He says, what will good happen for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? So one thing you and I need to know is that we have a soul. Yes, we might be flesh and blood on the inside and outside, you know, but I got to think about what is making us think, what is making us breathe, what is making us long inside of us to be with our creator, and that is the soul. This all goes back into when God said he breathed his spirit into man, Genesis 2, 7, it says, then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life or soul. And that is the Bible says the man became a living being. So before this breath, Adam was a pile of dust. 
I mean, no, we're all a pile of dust. Even the psalmist says we all go back to the dust. So interesting is, is that dust is literally made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. These are the same elements that make up a body. And God breathed a living spirit into mankind. And then that is when they became a living being. So we consider that you and I have a soul that God has placed individually inside each and every person on this planet. So the question is, what is the trade-off of gaining and losing the, the, the soul or the exchange? See, this means that people are willing to place their soul up for sale and allow it to be traded for something. Every Saturday, I'm sure you guys see it, every Friday as well, Billings has garage sales every corner. I see garage sales all the time. Well, people do the same thing for their soul. The question is why? Why would someone put up a garage sale sign for something that's so personal, something that's so unique, so amazing, that God, the Bible even says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that he knitted you in the womb and he made you this beautiful specimen why would people be willing to trade something so so powerful when it comes to Jesus he says we are willing to do this and then you actually have to read the verse before on why he says in uh, the verse 16 or Matthew 16 25 it says whoever desires to save his life will lose it whoever loses a life for my sake We'll find it. So that gives us a little bit of understanding for catching this. He says, if you're following me, that's what Jesus says. If you follow me, then you're going to have the satisfaction of life. In other words, your soul will be satisfied when you follow me. But the hard pill to swallow is then what's the alternative? Because Jesus says you got to first deny yourself. And I'm not talking about how this crazy world is, man. Yeah, believe me, I know. We, we live in a nuts, man. It's like a man is a man. How many understand that? A woman is a woman. But we live in a world where you can deny yourself and be anything that you want it to be. Listen, I'm all for somebody going and being a NASA astronaut. I'm all for those things. But how you're born is how you're meant to be. But we're understanding something is that deny your old way of thinking. That's what Jesus is saying. Deny your old way of living. Right there is the basis of keeping your soul aligned to God. So with that being said, we usually don't get this part of life until much later. I always find it interesting as people get older, they start thinking about the need for God. Sad part is many people look until the end of their ropes. They look when they have nothing left in life. They look until they're broke, busted, and disgusted. How many understand that? You know, kids, man, their desire is to know God. If you know a little kid, they're, they're up, they love God. You tell them about Jesus. You tell them about Noah. You tell them Abraham. They're like, man, I'm all about that. Like, they love it. They love drawing pictures of Jesus. But as we get older, we say, man, I don't need any of that. Get away from me, man. The question is, why do we damage the soul then? I got saved when I was 18 years old, and I'm telling you, God spared me from so much. So much that, that God spared. I couldn't even imagine getting saved later on in life, in my 40s or 50s, or even now at the age of 32. I couldn't even imagine all the damage I would have done. And believe me, I've already done damage to my soul. There's a saying, sticks and stones break bones, but words will never hurt me. But you know what reality is? That's a band-aid statement. It doesn't cover really the whole issue. The fact is clear is that a person's soul can take damage. They hurt themselves by the things that we do, things by that we see, how we treat ourselves. And you know what? Why, if the soul is so important, then why is it so neglected? I don't know about you, I, I drive in the morning around 6.30 in the morning and I always see people running. I see people walking their dogs. I see people throughout the year uh, running in you know, negative 25 degree weather. I find that crazy. I don't know about you, I think it's nuts. 
I'm like, go get a treadmill at this point. You know what I mean? Because uh, you're, you're running when it's negative. Nothing should be alive outside at that point. But people still run. How many know even in the summertime, people are still running in 100 degree weather? I drive by this gym every morning. I think it's called Bear Tooth Gym or something. And I, it's a warehouse. And every morning they have the garage open and it's packed, packed. I said, man, look at what people do. Right? What we're willing to accomplish. And the fact is, that's just the outside. That's just the outside. That's the skin. That's the muscle. That's, but it, 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 the soul's neglected the inside. People train their body. They train their muscles. But reality is, churches are still empty. And the reason why is because people often choose to satisfy the flesh rather than the soul. So let's talk about what affects the soul. In our Bible, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, every one of them have this text that Jesus says. Every one of them say, what will people exchange for the soul? But I want to highlight a couple, which is only in Mark and Luke. So Mark 8 and Luke 9. We're going to look at just a few verses there. These are are telling us what people are willing to trade for the soul. Because we all want to know. How many want to know? We read this verse and say, okay, what are we going to trade for the soul? We automatically think money. We automatically think some rich person driving a Lamborghini. But it's not. It's not those things. Believe it or not. Let's talk about what Mark 8.38 says. It says here, whoever is ashamed of me, in my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes to the glory of his Father with his holy angels. So what he's saying here, temptation. That is what people are willing to trade for the soul. And I'm going to tell you, temptation of the lust, of the flesh, it is the biggest killer. I'm going to tell you, this is a dicey part for many preachers because we don't really like to talk about these things. We don't really like to talk about sin too much because it, it makes people, uh, you know, a little bit, hey, you know, this guy knows something about me or, you know, why does he have to talk about that, you know? Just let me feel good and I could go home and, and go eat my uh, rotisserie chicken, you know, from Costco, you know? Just let me be. But the reality is you got to talk about that. You got to talk about the inside stuff that nobody wants to mention. And when it comes to Jesus, I'm telling you, he was never afraid to confront sin. He was never afraid to talk about the adulterous generation. Guess what? Back in 2000, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, I'm talking about zero AD. They still talked about the adulterous generation. Why is that? It's because the lust of the flesh has always been there. People have been lusting for a long, long, long time. How many know it's a serious world, man? Sick world. You could talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. You could talk about how even Lot with his daughters. You could go and talk about how Noah got naked, man, drinking wine. You could talk about all this stuff, man. You could talk about how when Cain left uh, his father, Adam, and he ran into the, the place of Nod and he started to fulfill his desires. It's because people are still seeking to please their flesh. So the question is, why is that such an affecting thing on our soul? Because if it feels good, it should be good, right? How many know God made man and woman? And when he made them, he made an image of his hand. And you know, when they became one, when they got married, it was meant to be a pleasing thing for each other. But the thing is, when sin enters a relationship, what it does, it distorts everything. To please the feeling is the greatest danger. Galatians 5.16, it says, I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. These things are contrary to each other. And so that you do not do the things that you wish. So he's saying here, the soul's in conflict. With pleasing the flesh. 
God wants us to plead. He says, man, you need to feed the spirit. What feeds you is the things of God. That's the natural thing. That's what the soul wants. The, the soul craves to be with God, the Bible says. It, it wants to be with God. But the outside, the skin, man, it's like a, it's like a battle that goes on. The, the skin does not want us to read the Bible. It doesn't want us to come to church. It doesn't want us to seek the things of God. It says it's that conflict. So the lust that we have in hearts, that is what keeps us always fighting. See, lusting eyes, Jesus tells us, they need to be pulled out and thrown away rather than enter the kingdom of God. He says it's better to go to heaven with one eye than go to hell with two. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 is flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. Whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. So what he's saying is that, you know, what goes on the outside, it greatly affects the soul that's on the inside. You can't look at something that you shouldn't be looking at and think it's okay. It's not going to bother you. It's not going to do anything. But reality is it does everything. Your soul is affected. When you have uh, sex outside of marriage, what it does, you're damaging the soul that's inside of you. And when people look at perverted things online, it damages the soul. You are sinning against the body, against this holy temple that is meant to be pure, meant to be clean, meant to live righteous. But when we do these things of the flesh, it greatly affects it. And when you do that, Jesus says, you are being ashamed of me. And that is when you trade in for the soul. Uh, trade in the world for your soul. The second thing that affects the soul, the Bible says, is the ashamed. The, I'm going to read this again in Luke 9, 26. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of Man, will be ashamed when he comes in his glory. I find that amazing because every single uh, version of this text all put that. Why would he put that? Why would he say that, you know, you trade? He says here, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? What will someone give in exchange for the soul? And he says here, at the end of that, uh, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, I will also be ashamed. Why? I find that so interesting. Because in, in the book of Mark, he puts that, uh, he says, man, you can't be ashamed. Why does ashamed damage the soul? Reason being is that living a life ashamed of God, living a life ashamed of the gospel, what that does, it, it brings an embarrassment. Have you ever seen somebody do something really embarrassing and you were like, e you know, you, you got hurt for them. Like you said, dang, I, like you felt like, I don't know, am I, you know what I mean? Like you see somebody do something really silly and you feel embarrassed for them, even though you were not the one doing it, Right. That's the, that's the word ashamed. The, the Bible talks about is the deepest form of embarrassment. So when you want to live for God, when you want to do godly things, but you deny it, right? You deny reading the word, you deny fasting, you deny living for God, you deny doing righteous things. That's when the Bible says you become ashamed of the gospel. And, and the, the worst part of that is when a lifestyle is ashamed of God. When your heart is so twisted, your soul is so confused, you shame, you're so ashamed of God, you can't even glorify Him anymore. And that's when God says, well, guess what? When you come to me in heaven, when your front shining, when my, my glory is shining in front of you, I will also be ashamed of you. That's when somebody trades their soul in. And I find that incredible. Well, let's end by restoring the soul. Because that's what God wants to do. I'm going to tell you, God wants to restore your soul. Psychology can't answer this problem. Sitting with a therapist can't answer your problem. They're going to sit you on a chair and be like, hey, we'll get, how's your day? They're not going to get to the root of the matter. The only thing that can actually restore a soul 
And the life is God. Is Jesus Christ. Psalms 23 verse 3. It says he refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. He does it all for him, man. How many know it's amazing? And uh, you, that's what I find so incredible is that God refreshes my soul for his name's sake. What that's saying is that, you know, when God breathed his breath, he breathed something pure inside of each, every individual. But as sin corrupts and it deletes a lot of things, and we damage this pure vessel inside of us. And he says here, I make it right for my name's sake. So he brings it right back. He refreshes the soul. I say this all the time. Jesus did not come to this earth so that we will be better Bible readers or so that we would cuss less than the next person. But Jesus Christ came to this earth to restore the soul. He's the only one on this planet that could fix the soul. I've known people that committed some pretty terrible things in life. They've done some pretty egregious things that if they, if you, if you've known who they were, they pro you probably wouldn't be friends with them. But the fact is, when they come torn in pieces uh, and they come to God with this heart, like God, restore me. I need you to restore me. God does a reversal on somebody's life. And this word refreshes, it, it really, it literally means to bring back. How many know that's good news? Amen. That God would restore a damaged soul, that he would bring back into what it's meant to be in the first place. Like I said, I know people that did some things to their body, uh, things to their mind uh, that would make them so corrupt, but they come to God and what he does is he makes them innocent. He makes them pure again. He makes somebody proud, humble. He makes a murderer loving. That's who God is. God makes a restoration of the soul. Not by a 12-week program, but by a surrendered heart. He has come to us. So what do we have to do? We have to actually come to Him and surrender. Psalms 41.3 and 4 says, The Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness. You will sustain him on his sick bed. Verse 4, I said, Lord, be merciful, to, first, be merciful to me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. So why would David write this? David is having an understanding within himself. He says, I have sinned in my soul. He's not being too proud. He's saying to God, I've done some damage here. I made some mistakes in my life. And I've sinned against you and I've sinned against myself. He's not being too proud. Listen, we can't be too proud. You know what they say, if you have a pig, you put makeup on, you put lipstick on a pig. Guess what's going to happen? It's still a pig. No matter how much makeup you put on a pig, you can put eye, eye blush, you can put lipstick, you can put all, you can put that powder on it, it still be a pig. Listen, we can't put makeup on sin and think, oh, it's okay. You can't put makeup on the soul and think, oh, it's okay. 1 John 1, verse 8, says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that good news? That Jesus Christ can purify the soul. He can restore your soul. How many know that? You don't need to live, leave this place thinking, dang, I'm still a screw up. Dang, I can't get restoration. Dang, I'm going to be stuck in the same both that I'm in. I'm going to tell you, friends, that God supernaturally, with the heart that is surrendered at this altar, God can supernaturally meet with you. And God can restore that precious gift that he's bestowed upon you before even the foundations of this world has ever been laid. God already knew you, made you, and knew what he wanted to do with you. I close with this story. 
I showed a video on the beginning, a female runner by, by the name, I forgot her name, Bol, she's a Netherlands runner. Well, back in 2023, she ran in the World Championships in a 4x4 four four mixed relay, meaning there was a man that started, went to a female, went to a male, then ended with the female. And anyways, in the run, she was winning. 2023, she was winning, and she was winning by a lot. And then she fell right at the last just couple of meters, and she lost the race, and they took last, you know. Well, guess what happened in the 4x4 four four relay in the Olympics? One year later, she ran again, and they gave her the baton once more. And this, look what happened in this last, uh, this last race real quickly. This just happened just a few days ago. Hopefully it's not terrible. Fantastic. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Here we go. She's in that orange, by the way. That's the girl right there I'm talking about. is a soul can be so damaged. So damaged. But if you just try again, what God does, He restores the soul. Amen. If we could do one thing, we could bow our heads in this place, respecting our neighbors and all those around us. Amen. God is good. God is good in His Word. Hallelujah. I want to thank everybody for coming, but we have business to take care of. Listen, God brought you to this place because He wants to meet with you. He brought you to this place because he wants to restore the soul. Jesus Christ didn't come to bring a new religion. He didn't come to say, guess what, guys? I'm going to make Catholics. I'm going to make LDS. I'm going to make uh, Baptists. I'm going to make Jehovah Witness. I'm going to make all these things so that you can follow a bunch of rules. And then hopefully by the end of your life, your goods would outweigh your bad. Jesus Christ didn't say any of those words. He says here that you must deny yourself and come follow me. And when you do that, you'll find life. And you'll find life more abundantly. That's what Jesus Christ came. Jesus Christ came to this earth to restore the soul. Your soul is damaged in this place. Your soul has been through so much. Whether by somebody harming you, somebody hurting you in the past. You might have done things to yourself. You sinned against your own body. And you live with torment. You live with pain. You look yourself in the mirror and say, man, look at this mess that I have to live with all the time. Maybe even people call you a mess. But Jesus Christ wants to change that. God wants to change that. You can leave this place refreshed, the Bible says, refreshed in your soul. But you have to come to him. He says, the psalmist says, David says, I have sinned. We can't be people saying, oh, I haven't sinned. I'm okay. I'm right. No, we can't be like that. If we're honest, God will help us. And God has brought you here so that you can be honest and you can come to Him. So very fast, God wants to restore your soul to this place. But you have to signify that. You have to say, here I am. I'm a sinner. I need you, God. So real quickly, you need Jesus. You want Him to come into your life. You want Him to refresh your soul. You don't want another religion. You don't want another rule book. You want to live for God. God wants to help you. Real quickly, I want you to do one thing for me. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to lead you to a simple prayer that God would meet with you. God would touch your heart. God would save you. 
tired of living the life that you're living. You think things are okay, but reality they're not. You want Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. You do not want to say, I want to confess your sins because the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us and to purify. That's what God wants to do. So real quickly, not saved. When Jesus Christ is coming to your heart, raise your hand. I want to pray with you. Hallelujah. Amen for the backslider. Backsliding means that once you follow with God, once you live with him, you might have said a prayer a while ago, but right now you currently aren't living right with God. The reason why you know that is because there's still things in your life that do not follow God. You still do things, you say things, you speak evil, you think evil, and you say, oh, I'm okay. No, reality or not. And that means you're backslidden, but God has drawn you back. He wants you to be in his will again. So for a backslider, I want you to do one thing. Raise your hand. I want to pray with you. I will lead you to a simple prayer. Give your life to Jesus. Don't leave this place the same way you came in. Amen. I see your hand. Anybody else? Anybody else in this place? God is speaking this day. God is talking to us. God wants to restore the soul that he's breathed upon you. Hallelujah. One more time. Raise your hand. Anybody else? Hallelujah. Amen. If you raise your hand, I want you to do one thing. You'll look at me very fast. I want you to look at if you meant that, right? Did you mean that? I'm going to pray with you. If you can come over here, I'm going to lead you to a simple prayer. You can come too if you want to pray. God's going to help us. Hallelujah. I'm going to pray with you, okay? of our souls for what you have done on the cross my Lord God uh, come into every single heart in this place God I so thank you God for your grace and your mercy oh hallelujah God you are mighty and awesome in power God we thank you hallelujah hallelujah oh you are mighty God amen let's give God praise in this place hallelujah Hallelujah, God, you are mighty. Amen. God is good. God is good. Live for him. If you made a decision this day, follow up with that decision. I'm going to live for God. What that means now is there's a part that you have to play. You can't just say, oh, thank you, God. Oh, I thank you for this gift. Now you have to live in that direction. So what that means is you have to take action. When you go home, as you leave this place, there will be things, temptations in life you have to get rid of. You have to. 
There's no way about it. There's no God coming into your house and saying, oh, let me leave that closet alone. No, God needs to come to every room in your house and do a complete restoration. If you've ever seen the show Hoarders, they don't leave one room nasty. They go to every single room and clean that place. Well, God does that. Now it's time to keep your temple holy. Live for Him. Watch your life be absolutely transformed. Live for Him. Amen. So come back tonight, if you will, 7 o'clock. We meet, have a whole different sermon, whole different message. Bring somebody. Tell somebody about Jesus, and God will help us. Let's go ahead and pray. Let's God help us. Amen. God, is, thank, God, we thank you for the blood. God, we thank you for what you have done this day. God, at this altar, God, we magnify your name. We thank you. Bring us back safely in Jesus' name.